Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Performance Talk. My name is Yul Gordon. I am excited to introduce our guest today. Uh, my man Chris is not is not with us right now. Uh, I didn't uh, hear from him this morning. I hope he's doing all right. But we are getting started uh, this morning in this episode with Dr. Chika Dahandeao. Doctor, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, forgive me if I mispronounced the name, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and and how you got into this. So, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. And um, thank you very much for pronouncing my name. It was far better than people pronounce it in India. But uh, <laughs> anyways, so uh, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Shikhar Dhondial, and uh, I'm from India, and uh, I belong to a state in Delhi. So uh, I have started my journey of a sports medicine. Obviously, uh, before that, I'll have to make a base. So I have uh, I have completed my MBBS and that had got completed in the year of 2016. Now, uh, taking up sports medicine was uh, never in my plan. It just happened with me. And uh, when I joined my post-graduation, I was a little skeptical whether to go ahead with it or not because uh, I had a passion to work in the sports. But yes, uh, it's not easy to uh, make the balance between your post-graduation life and also to work in the sports at the same time because it was really very tiring. And uh, I still remember my residency days where uh, we used to have these uh, planning and training sessions which were really abrupt because uh, the training session usually uh, happens uh, either in early morning or maybe in the late evenings. So we have to complete a residency schedule. And because I was so passionate about working in the sport, right. so I used to travel all the way, maybe sometimes early morning and late evenings. And I attended those training sessions. And eventually, uh, it just happened with me that uh, my first game had started uh, when I had represented uh, there as a field of play doctor uh, that was with the state level football team. So my journey of a sports medicine doctor has started with a, a state level football team and then it just goes on happening. I had worked as a ringside doctor with the boxing. I had worked as a field of play and FOP doctor or maybe a tournament doctor with the wrestling as well for the three consecutive years with the UWW. And uh, I can say that uh, it was a passion and it was uh, it was maybe... The God has some plans for me that, uh, yes, I, I had to just keep on moving. And I was blessed to work with almost all the sports in India. So my journey had started with football. I had worked during my post-graduation for a while in the boxing, in the wrestling. Then I've joined as a tournament doctor and the team doctor with the Indian hockey team. And then my journey had uh, again started as a team doctor with the senior women national football team. So... Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've co you've covered uh, a, a lot of sports and and worked with a lot of different level athletes. If I'm hearing you correctly, uh, what you're telling me and, and the audience is that you kind of uh, didn't start off to be in in sports medicine or work with athletes, but you liked athletics and and, and those kind of things. And and as you got involved with athletics, yeah. then this kind of mm -hmm. this kind of just happened. Um, not not accidentally, but kind of because you loved it, but you didn't plan it necessarily. Yes. And yes. then re realizing uh, realizing what the time constraints are. So yep. I heard you talk about working on the field of play for our audience. That's yep. that's that's a game doctor. She's av available at the games uh, or at the tournaments. That's the same at the matches for wrestling uh, mm. stuff like that. Is uh, do you work with a, a staff, an athletic training staff? The athletic is uh, not that uh, prevalent in India, to be very frank. So okay. uh, I'll tell you a very important thing, as we had been discussing just before the recording as well, that a lot of uh, federations uh, are not very well versed with the medical requirements of the team. Ah. So the strength ah. and conditioning, yes, it's important. And But what about the hidden aspect of the sports, I always say, the injury aspect. So ah, we, yes. always, we always talk about that this team had won a gold medal. This athlete had won. But what happened to that athlete if they, that athlete got injured during the field of play, maybe in competition and out of competition? So there are a lot of sports still 
I'm not saying in India, preferably maybe outside India as well, where they doesn't feel that, yes, maybe a medical team is that much important when it comes to having them on board with the team. So okay, wherever so, the requirement. So, so, so the structure over there is, is just like, you know, strength and conditioning, usually done by the coaches. Yes. And, and then, uh, and then the athlete, they, they don't have a, you guys don't work with an athletic trainer or a physiotherapist or a nutritionist or uh, what's, what's your setup over there professionally that, that where the medical side fits? Yes. Uh, but uh, luckily uh, there is a lot of uh, now involvement of uh, all the support staff in the team because okay. uh, yes, because uh, maybe we can thank uh, the lot of good people who had been in the Federation who wants to work for the betterment of the athletes. So now the support staff would involve a doctor, a physio, a strength and conditioning coach, a masseur okay. as well, and the athletic trainer. Okay. So I had been blessed that I had worked with them all, uh, okay. wherever which federation I had worked with. So, so you, uh, so, so working. Let me just ask it as a question instead of making a statement. Yes. How do you guys? Um, you mentioned that that you have all those those folks with a team. Yes. How are you organized? Or do they work individually? As individual entities with the team, do you work with it as a team within the team? How how do you how, how do they fit together, and how do you fit with them when you're working with the team? Yes, so that's a very nice question because uh, when we had mentioned the team, we travel with the team. Supposedly, I had traveled with the football team, so obviously, we all whoever had been with the team have to work for the betterment for the athletes and the team because right. eventually, we all want the team to win. But right. at the same time, he doesn't want the injury to happen and that will affect the play. So right. it's it's very important to maintain the boundaries, mutual respect for each other, for uh -huh. each other's work. And sometimes there could be a possibility that we can overlap each other's branch. But yes, I was blessed enough that I had worked with such a professional people that we always respect each other's boundaries. If I'm being a doctor, I'm prescribing that this particular treatment, this athlete will require. Then the physio was also very much professional enough to follow the norms. And yes, I also mutually respect if the physio has something to add up onto the treatment. Because eventually okay. it's all okay. about giving the advanced form of treatment. If I was just being minus somewhere, so yes, the SNC and the physio can add up onto something. And similarly, it's vice versa for both the cases. Right. So that's, that's, uh, sometimes we all get in our little bubbles and, and yes. we, we, you know, we may not play as well with others as we should. Mm. Yes. Uh, however, you know, it, it's important and it's good to hear that, that other countries are, and other professionals in other countries are, are hammering out these spaces as well and yes. make, and making sure that, you know, the team doctor works with the physio, works with the strength conditioning coach, yes. works with the the nutritionist, the psychologist, the Ooh. everybody. Uh, yes. Because the athlete is the the center point of the whole thing. Yeah. And and without that single athlete or those athletes to make a team, uh, we don't have a usefulness. Exactly. So yeah, that's that's great in the the in the professional life. Um, so all your work has been done in India, correct? Yes. Uh, and you travel with a national team? You've been outside the country with the national team? Yes. We had been uh, outside for the Olympic qualifiers uh, round as well. Okay. So how, yes. how, how did you perceive, if you had time, sometimes you don't have time to, to view other things, but how did you perceive other countries and how they did, you know, their work with, with what you do, your your sports medicine counterparts in other countries. Yes. So um, I had been to the countries. I had met different doctors out there. And I always feel that we have so much to learn from each other. So right. there are times, uh, because I'll not say that uh, I'm being the master of all trades. So right. there are some points that I might be lacking. And there are some points that the other people also might be lacking. So if I have to talk about India particularly, like my own country, and we know that we have uh, one of the world's largest population. And I had worked in uh, 
in a government sector in a hospital where i had been uh, i had been involved with tons and tons of patients so when it comes to uh, seeking the injury aspect when it's come to seeking the clinical aspect i'm so confident that yes i have seen all the aspect i have seen every kind of patients in my department not okay. to compromise the quality of the care because our center was one of the leading center in india which is sports injury center but okay. apart from that when i go outside i can see that patient numbers are less they are giving more time to the particular person because okay. they are the 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 level there are there are levels to proceed the doctor in india it's relatively easy because you know there are a lot of health sectors and you don't need to take the appointments wait for a longer period of time so you can directly come to the doctor and that's how you know there is a there is a difference in the way we are treating the patients so there is lot to learn from them that yes how they are doing it how we are doing it we we had an exchange of ideas when it comes to treating the patient and yes okay. on field off field also when we are we know two competing teams are sitting next to each other and when there is an injury happening so we are also you know we are also taking the idea that how the particular medical professional has been re- reacting on to that level of injury at that field of play so yes okay. there is lot to learn there is lot to learn and i always believe that uh, whenever we go to a new place we are meeting new people we always have an exchange of ideas and we always learn from each other it's it's always better when we're operating and acting as as one Um, yes as opposed to against each other so, yes so i i i i always tell folks uh competition is good until it's not yes exactly you know, it's, it's it's great to compete it's great to have fun in the spirit of of positivity but hmm. but but when you're competing and it becomes negative that nah, that's no good not at all it's it's uh, i i know when i was um overseas uh and and traveling a little bit more and and I'm a I'm a strength and conditioning guy performance guy by by profession but uh I have you know my my master's degrees in sports medicine my doctorate in psychology so I'm I'm kind of all over the map yes but what I found is every all all my learning kind of tentacles is that when we seek knowledge from each other yes it's 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 always better exactly it's always better and you have to be humble enough uh, in, in your own self and in your yes. in your own abilities to be able to yes. give them to someone else yes say say That's- yeah this is what i do this is how i do it maybe you can use it how do you do it that's exactly that's kind of how i try to start conversations when i'm not you know in my on my own turf so to speak yes so for so for for me we have always um you know to 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 work with a team doctor our our team doctors only become part of the team at a certain level okay. so some some big some big um secondary schools have like like high schools before university uh some of those have have you know sports doctors that that work with them but not not necessarily full time there as an, an an extra thing or an additional thing that they do uh once you get to uh once you get to the university level and the national team level and and professional sports then there, of course there's a a team doctor all of the time so as the team doctor here you are in charge of the the medical direction pre during and post injury. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the process uh that you go through over there and and how maybe it it's a little different than than over here. So so the first thing is when we are a part of a team. So the, the first thing that I would like to have uh, it from all the athletes is to ask their basic medical history. So that will involve an annual medical examination. if they had all already got it done in the in the in the previous year so i will always try to compile everything and would always try to pinpoint that if there is anything which is uh, regressive or negative for a particular athlete or not now i want to put a very important mark here because uh, i had been dealing with the female athletes and there are a lot of issues associated with the female athlete we know that we know i think everyone in sports knows about the female athlete triad 
but now yes. eventually it has moved on to the red as which is relative energy deficient syndrome so uh, the most important thing that i have tried to focus on my athletes to always keep in mind and ask them about their last menstrual period but okay, because so we get a baseline them, so we get a yes. baseline yes and, and then and using the example of the female athlete you're you're starting with the last menstrual period because now yes. we're looking into the we know about the triad and then the other uh, condition exactly. was yes okay yes so uh, obviously to start with a menstrual history to about their calories intake and then always uh, associated with all the factors related that their their cns is doing fine whether they have any gut problem or not because i don't want to miss the 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 hidden aspects which can create a lot of struggle for the athlete later on Yes, we okay. never focus on the psychology and sleep earlier. Now there are a lot of talks that right. have been going on about the sports psychology. But I have myself encountered that there are a lot of athletes who had been a victim of jet lag, had been sleep deprived, had been the insomnia going on for weeks, and they are they are shy to talk about certain issues or stress factors or the anxiety issues ah. that they might already had been having. Okay. And that's what I always believe that empathy. you have to carry on with you you have to make a reputation with the athlete because no one will come to you and be talkative yeah, about yeah. their issues on the day one yeah they're not going to volunteer that stuff right off the bat never back. never and uh, then this is just a basic part annual medical examination and yes if it is just before the tournament we have to go through the pcma or the pre participation examination so as okay. per according so supposedly if i'm going on, going on with the football team so i have to do the fifa assessment form which is a pcma form it is right. a thorough head to toe examination we have to go through the ecg there are 2d echo there are x rays there are musculoskeletal and then right. few blood investigations basic investigations to know that whether they are not anemic they are not having any any profiling which is uh, which is just right. having some error on it and it's very important to look into that because a slight error in the blood parameters or maybe their vitamin d deficiency they are more prone to having the stress injuries as we all know that that right. they are one of also very common in these sports so if we have any red flag on those areas if that can be rectified yes we can rectify it suppose it is a vitamin d deficiency we can give them the supplements for a while but what this, about the yes and i'm i'm sorry i just a, a yes. quick point here this is when for our audience uh for our listeners this is when supplementation is appropriate. If if you do all the 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 work prior to to get all the the baseline information, then you find a deficit, then yes. you go to the doctor and say, "Hey, doc, I'm I'm I think maybe my athlete needs or the athlete needs." And then this is where we go, "Okay. Sorry about that." Okay. So, uh yes, this is where the role of supplementation starts, but as we all know that sports is also is very important another aspect is the anti doping so the supplementation should never cross the line that you There are taking it to the limits and for yeah. the purpose of performance and en enhancement not for the therapeutic purpose but everything will be just revolving around in just increasing the performance then we call it as taking a substance in the form of doping so yes right. one should be well versed with the fact that the supplementation that you are giving doesn't comes under the wada anti doping list so a doctor should be well versed with the wada rules the anti doping rule violations and the anti doping list which actually annually every time it just got having some uh, some add ons and some subtractions going on so yeah, we updated. should be well versed with that yes yeah it gets updated sometimes sometimes yes. too often but yes but i i do understand that uh you know they're they're trying to 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 stay in line with fair competition and those kind of things so yes. so yeah uh it, it's important to for i i think it's important for everybody to to True. to be at least familiar with all the the anti-doping agencies and the restricted list and 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 the different levels simply because um you know a lot of times the strength coaches ask what what protein what protein powders should i take yes. should i take creatine should i take yada 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 whatever and then if the if the strength coaches is are not talking to the doctor not talking to the nutritionist and just kind of handing these things out 
that's that's where I see sometimes a lot of athletes get into trouble, especially those athletes who are trying to make it. They're trying to get to the highest levels and they're just a tier below and they want every advantage that they can get. They're not they're not purposely trying to cheat. Exactly. They're just trying to get an edge. Yes. So so yeah, it's it's I it, it's important. So moving on, we talked about uh, a little bit about um, let's go back to female athletes. We we go back to the female athlete triad and the different situations with females. What are some unique um, things that you have found that are important to note? if you're going to work with female athletes? So in the female athletes, uh, like I already had started uh, previously as well with their menstrual history. So uh, we talk about the menstrual hi menstrual history and menstrual irregularities or abnormality, which is being one of the part of the triad. But what about their last menstrual history? Why I was focusing on their last menstrual history too much because uh, if you also know that uh, there is a, there is this recent thing which has been happening in the sports and which we call it as an abortion doping. So that the female uh -huh. athlete, what they had been doing is they are just getting pregnant just before the game because we know that the hemo concentration would happen. There will increase in the blood count and eventually it will going to have increase in the endurance. So they just get it aborted just before the games so that to have the increase in that hemo concentration which can increase the performance now most of this athlete doesn't know that why we are asking the last menstrual history they are thinking that they are just asking it for the sake now the second thing is it's just not about the menstrual history we should also be focused about the kind of contraceptive measures they had been taking because we know that there are OCPs, certain OCPs are banned in sports, whether they are going to use the barrier protection method or certain kind of uh, progesterone okay. pills or estrogen pills, which could hamper later on comes in their doping. And the third part is obviously itself that menstrual irregularities is one of the component of female athlete trial. So to cater to those three points, I always take care of asking the last menstrual history. Now, apart from asking their last menstrual period or whatever history, we also have to just be a little thorough and be a little deep in asking the way their menstrual cycle works, how much how much number of pads they had been using, whether they are maintaining the hygiene itself or not. Because I myself had seen there are lots and lots of cases of UTI in the females. Ah. And they are they are very shy to talk about it. So they had right. been they had been cases of increase in frequency, urgency of urine. They had been going on for a long and eventually there was a paper which was saying a lot of female athletes had been affected by a kidney disease later on in their stages of life because that chronic UTI had never been treated. They never well, talked about see, see, and that's that's things that are not talked about. And, and, yes. and to be honest, with 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 the number of male coaches in female yes. sports, I can, I, you know, it's 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 an area of of training and performance and and this whole thing that we don't like to we like to say. Well, you train female athletes the same way you do males. Yes, well, you 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 do train them the same, but yes. you have to take care of them appropriately. True. Yes. The, yes. The, the the care is what's different. Is yes. what the difference where the differences are. Yes. So while while female a athletes, uh, you know, can go in the weight room and do the same thing as males, weight that you know with difference in the weights, they can do the same exercises. Basically, you 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 have to pay attention to the things that you're talking about, so that there are not health issues. Or yes. inadvertent performance issues down the road. Exactly, that's very important. Okay, that's 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 a great piece. I mean, I bet uh, you got you want to go further on that. I mean, I'm I'm our listeners are probably going. Uh, so the thing is that yes, uh, we can talk on that for 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 hours because that's such area uh, which had never been talked about quite often. I'll be very honest because if if you'll know about the recent uh, study that is also by the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which had talked about the gender bias in sports as well. So okay. uh, 
be it the female sports medicine physicians be it the female athletes be it the female coaches yes there was a, there was a lot of uncertainty and there is a lot of bias that has been drawn i will take a very simple example of a biggest tournament that i had been involved with and uh, i was uh, shocked to see the situation of the toilets in the in competition stadium and ah. there were a lot of female athletes who had been coming out from the game and when i see the situation it was very bad and they had been saying that yes whenever we attended the tournament everything was been taken care of but apart from putting a lot of stress on the washrooms or the toilets nobody came yeah. to clean them up and that is such area which is very crucial to talk about because if they get infected it is it's gone it's going to be on them for life long because if we have to compare a male with the female so male always are the carriers of the disease and females are always the case of the disease it simply means that carriers means you are having that component of bacteria or virus inside you but you are not having symptoms so right. you are you can you can give it to anyone but a female if they get involved it is going to produce the symptoms and if they'll not talk about their symptoms it goes on it goes on and becomes chronic and it will going to affect their organs so this is something which yeah. i think we should put more focus on and we should not neglect it is this is a uh, this is um you know down the 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 performance continuum when you when you talk about these kind of things you're talking about shortening careers um you know hampering careers and, and at the very least at the very least the most important thing to the athlete affecting their performance so if i'm if i'm having issues because either i i won't use the toilets at a competition or i i i use them and and there's risk then i'm not going to be at my best mentally to to be able to go out there and perform i i i, I have a daughter and she was an athlete a, a a pretty good athlete and she went to play in at the collegiate level the you know she used to tell me some things back way back when she said dad it's not you know it's not the same for for men as it is for women i said well i know but you got to go through she said no that's not what i mean she said what i mean is you know come and look at you know where we're asked to do this or where we're designed or what or the area they put us in or or how they take care of us come and watch that mm -hmm. so i started doing that and, and and i started speaking up because you can't just you can't look at it you can't see it and say oh well that's just how it is Yes. You have to speak up. Wow, that that's that's some pretty interesting stuff. Now we could like you said we could talk the next uh you know 3 or 4 hours about just yeah. that. But uh True. let's 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 move on a little bit to uh your career and let's say your perspective of your success. If you're 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 a professional when you came into the field uh, like like we all do when we start off we feel kind of Well, what did I get all this education for? I still don't know anything. That's the way I felt. I was like, man, I don't know nothing. But once you get started, what advice do you have for other younger professionals coming in to kind of just take a breath, calm down, and and let's move? Yes. Uh so uh, a lot of juniors had questioning me and they mailed me they texted me uh because uh they saw my Instagram profile or maybe some LinkedIn profile they saw some picture uh inside the stadium and they get uh, really fascinated by the fact that wow uh you're standing in the stadium you're representing your country and they said we also want to work with this football team or we also work with this particular team So uh, I always had this one thing that uh, when you join any branch be it uh, sports medicine be it an SNC be it a physio or nutritionist or whatsoever you should have a passion for it because life is not easy when you talk about traveling with the team no it's not easy you have to travel for hours to different time zones get jet lagged and at the same time <laughs> you have to think about you have to think about yourself i had been the victim right. of jet lag i got stuck in the airport for 72 hours but when wow. i had to take the decision I had to take the decision me and the head coach had to take the decision that whether we should stay back or to send the team forward we decided to send the team forward because the athlete needs rest more than us but at right. the same time we were jet lagged we have to take care of the team we have to take care of ourselves and it's not easy so you cannot right. just uh, judge a book by its cover because you are just seeing one particular picture which is edited which has right. got a great caption 
and which had got been selected by hundred of pictures you're not actually looking onto that aspect that we are really working hard we are the right. we are the warriors which work behind the cameras we never came uh, in the forefront and we just make up blah blah about that we were working hard for the athletes everybody is working hard have a passion for it and you should not be like i want to represent the country start it from a state level an athlete also had started from a state level from a college level from a district right. straight national right. and then goes to international so love the sports love your branch and love doing what you do then only you can proceed or get success in your particular field well that's 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 uh that's some great advice uh, you know a lot of times you know we watch the young professionals come in and, and they're energetic and they they have it all and they 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 want to be on top and then they get on top and they don't realize you know well you know why do i they, they their their questions are why do i have to work these long hours why do i have to do yes. this why do well because that's what we do yes that's that's what we do if you want to be involved with athletics your your time no True. longer belongs to you True. It, it belongs to the athlete, the team, the organization, and everybody wants some yeah. of it. That's very true. So, um, so that so that's great advice. So, uh, the next question is is if you had to start again, if you had to start again, would you do it again? So, um, if it is uh, related to sports medicine as a career, yes. So earlier when I had joined, I will be very honest that I had no clue that what I'm gonna do. but today seeing myself uh, being very happy and uh, i just want to say that uh, it's not easy it's it's there are a lot of struggles there are a lot of hardships but i've still holding on to that uh, that uh, meme of being a sports medicine doctor i'm loving it and uh, i just uh, i'm just so happy to be us uh, representing my country as a sports medicine doctor so i would always want to be one So, so 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 this is a this is a this is a little bit of a question in a question but so so you said you didn't start off uh thinking that that that's what you were going to do what were you going to do So uh being a doctor being a clinician right. uh, uh on a genuine note I uh, we were always like uh, more uh, more towards the studies not more playing into the sports or all right, so right. I always had this dream that yo I can be an eye surgeon or uh, i can join medicine and i can i can be in the hospital see a lot of patients so that uh, that particular time when i was about to get into the branch i had this notion that i want to be an eye surgeon and i always wanted to be one so i was okay. little uh, a little sad that no maybe if i'd be able to do the justice with the branch or not but uh, then it's it was all in the destiny and it right. was all in the fate that uh, now i'm happy that i'm not being surgeon i'm i'm representing <laughs> yeah, uh, my tougher. country so yes it's more tougher yeah <laughs> but yes life life uh, life in a sports is also not that easy no no uh, trust me i i i do know that behind the scenes one of the reasons i started this podcast was to give people a peek behind the curtain uh and and kind of that's why we don't always ask Yes. You know, we're not always on technical or clinical or those kind of questions. We 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 try to get behind the scene to let the listeners understand and see, hey, look, you know, these these people back here, they're working and they are not the ones becoming millionaires. Yes. You know, so so while you can while there is an opportunity to make a living in sports, you're you're not going to be the richest person on the planet. Yeah, true. <laughs> so So uh yeah the the uh another thing is if we continue to go behind the curtain a little bit give us a give us a good story of of something unique that happened to you while working in sports medicine that you can't get anywhere else in, instead of besides working in sports So uh I'll uh, I have this very emotional story to say okay. uh I I was working with the under 20 uh women's team So they were they were kids and uh, they were they were highly energetic and they played really well. So it was a one on one with the with the opposition team. But eventually the goal difference was there and we lost it to the AFC qualifiers round. Okay. Then we came back to the dressing room and the girls were crying like anything. 
they were like no our career had ended where are we going to go and uh, at that particular time i had realized that no my duty is not just being doctor treating injuries and just prescribing a rehabilitation or medicines to them that time i was being there to them like a guide like a mentor or maybe like just a helping hand to calm them down and i have realized that this particular area which because my character involves a lot of empathy and uh, i think i was not able to cope up that much because uh, in the hospital we have to maintain the boundaries with the patient right. yes we right. should treat them nicely but with the athlete no we have to draw the boundaries down and we have to be there with their emotional roller coaster right because that that would always be in there when we lose a match and right. eventually we have to go back make them pick it up for the next game so i started loving that bit apart from just treating injuries there is much more i can do and yes then we become like a family and okay. it's not possible okay. when we are with we are with the hospital because uh, it it had been taught to us in the medicine then no love and affection with the patient you will eventually start being emotional treat them nicely be sensitive to them but don't love them that is that that what had been taught to us yeah but yeah. with the athlete no they become a part of our family they are like children to us that that is something unique about athletics there there is a relationship there that you yes. form that's deeper than just the the everyday the everyday consultant so to speak yes you yes. know so you know if you're if you're a consultant and i come in to work with an athlete okay here's your problem here's 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 three solutions that you can choose from which one do you want to do here's how yes. you use it hey uh, good luck i hope it works for you if it doesn't come back we'll try to figure something out bye Yes. You can't do that with athletes or, or that you'll no. never see them again. <laughs> exactly. That's you'll very true. You'll never see them again and and yes. on top of that um I I do think that in our profession and working with athletics because it's the the while while athletics and the competition is not the be all end all of the world. Yes. At that point, at that particular time in their lives, it is for them. Exactly. I and, have seen and, that. Yeah, and if we don't care about the individual athlete, if we don't care everything we do, if you're a strength coach, if you're a skills coach, if you're a doctor, if you're going to work in athletics, everything starts with caring. Yes. Very and, true. And it and it's it has to be genuine because the athlete will be the first one to tell you eh, they don't care. Yes. They yes. they're the first ones to tell you. So so that's um uh, so that's a that's a great point. Uh you know, I didn't really think about that. Uh I haven't really thought about that from that perspective. But yeah, you're walking in there after a tough loss and and basically you're the first one they see. Yes. Or you see them as they come in and and they're talking to you. Yes. You can't just push them away. Not at all. So that's, that's They don't even I'm, care about the injury that time. Yeah. If they lost, yeah. they don't care about the injury. Yeah, they could be bleeding. Yes, they are bleeding, but <laughs> yeah. they are like we we had lost the game and then eventually at the at the same time you have to calm them down and you have to tell them that this is also important because you have to play the next game. Right. Yeah, that's that's uh So let's let's go for that's a great uh great segue to the next section. Let's talk about injury a little bit. Let's talk about uh injury prevention and then uh rehabilitation after after injury doctors often often don't get to see athletes prior to the injury you know you might see them around you talk to them you ask them how they're feeling and those kind of things but if they if, if the young lady you know sprains a, a an ACL or strains a, a a hamstring then you see her in your capacity of solving the problem yes so so talk to us about the the first part of that which is the prevention and how important that is. So I'll give you a very basic example uh okay. like we, we had talked about the pre competition medical assessment and right. if I'll talk about injuries because most of the injuries in the sports are majority of the injuries are musculoskeletal injuries. Yes. So if uh, yes and uh, the contact injuries like ACL injuries and PCL injuries and there are overuse injuries. So right. when we are doing a MSK uh, examination of the athlete and if you are if you are thoroughly doing it so we have to keep in mind few things whether there is bio 
mechanical abnormalities present there or not yes when it is a female athlete we know they have more propensity to get the acl injured why because their knees are narrow they have got yeah. more amount of tibial torsion and i have seen a lot of athletes having a flat foot which is a yes. very important factor to get the stress injuries to get the shin pains to get the acl injuries as well then the broader pelvis in the females and this narrow uh, knee may also you know aggravate to a lots of injuries then talked about the ligaments laxity which no one talks about right and there are lax ligaments and then we can see a bowler having a shoulder dislocation he never had it but he said that i used to feel the subluxation but now i just tried to have the ball you know i just released the ball and i felt my shoulder got dislocated if that could have been already assessed previous back in the competition assessment we can change we can ask with the sssc coach to just keep in mind that this particular athlete yeah. ligaments are lax and then the technique can be changed so that is the reason a thorough assessment just before the competition and the annual medical you know examination is very important that we can have always have this thing in mind that this is something abnormal with this athlete and they have the chances of getting the injury if if some of those things are identified early uh then there's things you can do in the in the strength conditioning realm to, yes. to help strengthen areas that will help protect the athlete yes I, i'm a you know i'm a firm believer in prevention now i know that uh, you know every every athlete's body alignment and posture is is slightly different but but there's some some differences that can be pointed out on almost every male and female just gender based yes so when you when you go into that room and and you look around and you thought you were going to be working with with all males and you see half the room is females you have to switch that on in your brain and you have to understand that hey look you know we have some we have some q angles we have some ligament laxity we have some other things that might be going on here and then there's you know might not be getting the 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 full effort i'm going to get because of where they are in their menstrual cycle so there's an approach you have to take in the yes. weight room when it's when it's mixed now and and i owned a private facility for a long time i'd have females and males in there at the highest levels of their sport training and i had one young man ask me coach I, you know why do the girls do this and or why do the girls get to do this and and we do this and and you kind of a, you 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 talk to them different i said because they have different things going on they do the same exercises the efforts the same the intensity is the same it's just it's look at them it's she's she is different it's her, physiologically both are different yeah and yeah. so but when you it's it's when you get to to when they ask those kind of questions i get excited because that means they're paying attention exactly they're paying attention and uh you know he did, he just wanted to know and he he was a 22 year old and he went right back over and and kept working the way he was supposed to he just had a question and yes. i encourage questions all the time so it's important for those uh we call them pre-screenings but those those early uh identification of 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 things every female's q angle is not the same not at all yes uh but um but just about every female will have ligament laxity somewhere that's just yes. just just because Yes. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to affect them either. It may it may not affect them at all. But it's nice to know if they do have it. Yes. Uh also one important point I want to bring here is uh, it particularly in females that uh, when they are going through their ovulatory phase that is mid part of their menstruation that particular time there is this hormone which got secreted we call it as relaxin and that particular time their most of the ligaments are relaxed. and they have the more probability to get the acl or the ligament injuries okay yeah yes. so so that's that's so that happens in every female yes it's it's with every female okay and during that time they're more susceptible yes wow so the okay, fourth so, important point to ask for the last menstrual okay all right yes. so so i'm going to i'm going to as we're starting to get into our wrap up time here i'm going to ask uh ask you to go ahead and and get on into um 
as the as as the competitions uh pile up, you know, injuries start to happen, whether it's uh an acute injury or not, mm. whether it's condition, how do we watch for and prevent those things? So uh, help after pre- the- help prevent. Yes. Uh, so after every injury, uh, the, the doctor has to make an injury report, a final injury report that uh, this athlete with this date at that time of the tournament, of the field, on the field, within the training ground, the level of injury, where exactly the injured part was there, you have got it investigated or not. And we have to compile it all together and send it to the federations because now, if the camp is off or they are going for some different leagues, so the so the federation should be well versed with the fact that this particular athlete is injured or not. Now, it is up to me as a team doctor that I have to decide that if some supposedly if the athlete got a fracture. So I'll have to decide that, yes, they have to make it plaster for at least one to two weeks. We have to get the check x-rays done. And if the x-rays comes to be fine after a hairline fracture or so, or maybe a ligament injury, they are fit to return to play. So injuries need to be tackled very seriously if that is happening in the competition. Okay, so now let's let's talk about return to play. Who's uh, there's there's some very there's some very hard line you know directions on return to play here in the, in the states. I feel like that return to play for everybody is different, but there's some people that talk about oh you have to do this for an ACL, oh you have to do this for um, uh, Achilles tendon tear, you have to do this for a hamstring. I think you have to pay attention to the athlete first. Yes, exactly. So um, I always believe uh, to follow an optimal loading protocol. It's okay. very simple. There are a lot of protocols with the, with the different names. But the, the very first stage of the optimal loading talks about the isometrics. And the isometrics also had said that, yes, the hold on duration should be 45 seconds and your pain scale should be less than five out of 10. So you should never neglect the pain if the athlete is having while performing the exercise. You should not just push the athlete to just go ahead with the exercise. It doesn't matter. You will be fine. No, only proceed to the stage two, three and four if the athlete is pain free. The range of motion is complete. There is no effusion and swelling and you cannot appreciate or see any asymmetry in between both the limbs, whichever okay. part is injured. And then you only can proceed forward with the rehabilitation protocol. So I always follow the same. I always focus on what athlete is giving me the history in every step of the loading protocol. And if I have a chance to put it back, I don't mind. Because the protocol should be gradual. It should not be too harsh on the athlete. Because we don't want eventually an overuse injury to be overlapped with an acute injury. Right. The one of one of the things during that um, that during that protocol that I have you know that I have incorporated at week twelve. I usually see the athlete about week twelve or rehab. That's mm-hmm. that's you know you're that's pretty far along, but it's about when they start thinking about hey, I need to get back on the field. Yes. So so when I pick them up, it's okay. How are we? How are we moving? Did we just load for load sake or did we was was there good alignment? Where were their hips? What what was was going on when they took the step? Do they have full range of motion? And can they do can they do all these things pr- pain free and then start to do at a lower level yes. change direction? Yes. Can you change direction walking? Can you change direction or can you move backwards? Can you jump and land? Can you, you know, just simple things that yes. athletes do without even thinking about. Exactly. So, yes. uh, you know, w- with that said, um, understanding all of that, um, I, I hate to cut this off now, but we are at the end of our time. And, and we were, I feel like we were just getting rolling and we yes. were just getting started, but it has been uh, it's been great having you on. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you working with me at the front part of this to get everything uh, together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are with Dr. Shika Dandia. Thank you. Uh, has been our guest today. And uh, it's been a great time and I appreciate having you on.
and uh, thanks for having me on board and uh, it was a really an insightful discussion we also had learned a lot from each other a uh, very insightful discussion and uh, hope to have more of more of this kind of discussion hope i can just add on some of my expertise and experience so that can help a lot of people well and you that have, can just clear the clarity you have you have just been put on the on the back burner and not taken off so we will see you again Surely, we, definitely. We, you will hear from us for sure. Thanks a lot for having me here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been Performance Talk. Uh, we'll see you.